Hey, hey, it's Tommy, and I'm about to photograph an air show this weekend, so I figured this would be a great time to talk about some key elements of photography gear that I like to bring to photograph an air show in hopes to inspire you guys to go out and try one for yourself. Now, this is just going to be talking about the pieces of gear that I brought along with me to this weekend's show, as well as also more emphasizing on what features that this has so that you can try to find something similar. You don't necessarily have to get what I have here. This is more of like a mid-tier price point that, of, that I've accumulated over the time. You could find a much more affordable range of lenses and cameras and things like that. But you could also go on a higher price point than what I have too. Um, all of this will work great as long as you really focus on what I talk about when it comes to the features that are really essential and really helpful for airshow photography. So we'll talk about all the basic stuff. We'll also talk about what to bring along, some optionals that you could bring along based on how the airshow changes as it goes along, but also some fun things to do if you have some extra time and it doesn't take away from the focus of getting that really cool aircraft shot, you know? So we'll talk about all that and then I'll take you out to the field in the next video and we'll talk about settings. While we're in the field, we'll talk about how I actually put all this gear to use and, you know, maybe do a little post-processing at the end of that to show how I edit the photo. It usually doesn't take much to edit an air show photo once the settings are right. But we'll play around with that anyway in the next video. So this is the prep work before the show, so I hope you enjoy. All right, so there are two features on your camera that you should consider that are the most useful when photographing an air show, and that is the resolution and the burst modes frames per second rate. So first off, the resolution or megapixel count is very helpful for being able to get a little bit of extra reach when you're post-processing on the images later. Sometimes you just can't get enough distance on that photo and you really like the trick that the aircraft was doing, you really like the way the shot looks, it just looks a little too small in the frame. Uh, well, if you have a higher megapixel count, then you're able to crop in on that photo and that'll allow you to zoom in a little bit better. So, that won't take too much of a penalty hit when it comes to your overall resolution of the image and you won't get things like uh, diffraction artifacts and other damaging things when you over zoom in on a photo. So it's good to have a nice high number. I would say roughly anywhere from 20 to 30 megapixels is like kind of a nice range of stuff. I know a lot of cameras these days shoot in that range as well. 30 is like the sweet spot because it allows you to crop a ton while still being able to handle the amount of file size that's gonna come in. So every time you take a photo, that megapixel amount of data is gonna come onto the card and it gets pretty high pretty quickly. So if you can handle it, by all means, keep going up on megapixel count. That just gives you more and more real estate to crop in, more and more without sacrificing how the quality of the photo is going to go. What I shoot with is a 45 megapixel camera, so I have a lot of cropping real estate, albeit at a penalty of I have a lot of data coming in when I take these photos. Especially because our next feature is the frames per second burst mode. So burst mode is going to be your most used thing in the field when a jet is flying in or an aircraft is coming down and you're anticipating when that trick is about to happen, right at the start of a trick that you think is happening, you fire off a volley of shots. You're going to just hit that shutter and fire off as fast as you can. I believe some camera manufacturers call them like high speed drive mode, they call it burst mode, um, multi-shot mode, things like that. It's really the feature that you want to be the fastest on your camera without sacrificing anything such as, um, you know, resolution or anything like that. So with that being said, 
a faster frames a second will allow you to nail the right timing on the shot that you're looking for when you fire off that burst. I've shot older cameras before that only did three to five shots in a second with that burst mode. And I feel like almost every single time, the point of the trick that I really wanted to capture is on the in-between part, right before every shot was taken. So that's always really frustrating. You get kind of annoyed with that really quick. So the faster per frames per second your camera can capture, the more likely you're gonna get that split second you really want. Um, a really great example of this is this phenomenon known as a shock egg. It's also called a vapor cone. And what happens is, is an aircraft will be moving so fast through the sky that it legit slices the humidity and causes the air to condensate around the aircraft and causes this little condensed vapor cloud that goes around the aircraft and it looks almost like the aircraft is bursting through a cloud. If you get this photo, it looks amazing. It's a great looking shot. It looks like the aircraft is high speed just because of the way the vapors are coming off this thing. It's an amazing shot, but... Whoa! Yeah, it is a split second long. It does not last very long at all. It is very quick. It comes in and out. You see it flashing. And if you're not firing off those frames a second as fast as you could during a high speed pass, there's a good chance you'll miss the shot. So the faster frames a second your camera can provide you, the better off you're gonna to wanna to be. I recommend I would stay around 10 frames a second at minimum. Um, my camera itself shoots 12 frames a second. My camera is a Canon R5 and it shoots 12 frames a second mechanical at 45 megapixels. And that's really, really helpful. It could also shoot 20 frames a second electronic, but we'll get into that more in the field. I don't really like to shoot electronic when it comes to aircraft photography because you're gonna be panning the camera. And as you're panning the camera across and shooting in electronic mode, it introduces this like warping wobble kind of resolution. Um, at least on the Canon R5 it does. I feel like it's, this is the stack sensor issue. If there is a stack sensor in your camera, such as a Canon R3 has, um, I believe a Nikon Z9 has it, things like that, you'll be able to shoot and you won't get that warping wobble. You'll be able to shoot in electronic, no problem. For a Canon R5, mechanicals 12 frames a second is more than enough and you don't run the risk of having the jet look really weird and stretched out. So yeah, those are the two key features that I would say to bring to the table for your camera. Next up is let's consider how many batteries you should bring. Uh, this day and age, you have probably a mirrorless camera by now. And if you don't, great DSLR camera batteries, you only need like one or two and it lasts the whole day, it's awesome. But mirrorless cameras, they can tend to suck down the battery really quickly. I would say bring at least three batteries with you if you can. Um, this obviously can vary depending on whether or not you have OEM batteries or third party batteries. Uh, third party batteries, by the way, I would look up some forums or take some research on that third party brand that you bought because that could affect how many frames a second you get as the end result. Say your camera advertises like 12 frames a second, but then you put this third party battery in and now you're doing six frames a second or seven frames a second, or there's blackout in your shutter. Like there could be a lot of issues that a third party battery can bring. So do your research first and make sure that that's okay, at least for burst mode, especially, because burst mode is kind of like a whole different beast of a feature that you're gonna absolutely want when you're out photographing aircraft. So if we're talking about OEM batteries, I would say two or three is probably a sweet spot. I always bring four. It's a large amount of batteries, especially because batteries are 80 bucks a pop on a Canon R5. But what I do is I have two batteries in my battery grip on the camera. 
and I'm just photographing the air show with those two, and I have two brand new fully charged batteries sitting in my camera bag. Whenever a headliner comes in, such as, um, you know, when you go to the air show, they usually advertise like crazy. They'll advertise a specific performer, such as the Blue Angels or the Air Force Thunderbirds or an F-22 Raptor or an F-35 Lightning. You'll know what the highlight performance is whenever that highlight performance um, comes to your air show. This is the best time to use those fresh batteries that are in the bag. As soon as that happens, what I do is I take out the batteries that I've been using the, over the course of the day, and I'll pop in the fresh battery to make sure I have a fully charged, ready to go, just for those headliners. Even if the important ones that I definitely want to take photos of are somewhere in the middle of the show, I will take that with the brand new battery, take the, take the fresh battery out after the performance, put the other battery back in and continue on about my day until another headliner comes in and then swap again. So it's nice to have multiple batteries to play with, especially if your camera is gonna suck down batteries anyway really quickly. But if your camera is pretty efficient on batteries, I would say at least have one if not two in the bag, fresh and ready to go for when those headliner performances come on. All right, let's talk storage. now. Obviously, you can store it on a memory card after memory card after memory card. Um, that's the easiest in-field way of doing it. However, that does get pretty expensive when you look at things like my Canon R5 takes CF Express Type B cards. It also takes SD cards, but um, whenever you have two different cards in the camera, the card that's the slowest read and write speed will be the one that is automatically applied to when it comes to clearing the buffer of your camera. So you'll fire off a burst of like 15 shots and on the faster card, it can maybe do those 15 shots in like a half a second, but the slower card takes three seconds. Well, those 15 shots will not come off your camera. You'll have to wait for those full three seconds in order to clear that buffer and allow those shots to happen again. So with that being said, I don't even use an SD card in my Canon R5. Uh, there are fast alternatives of SD cards. So there's two different kinds of SD cards. There's a UHS-1 and a UHS-2. The UHS-2 is very fast and I would recommend, if your camera can support that, to buy those. They're a little expensive compared to the old ones. The old ones you can get a UHS-1 for like 30 bucks, whereas the UHS-2 is close to $200. So it gets really pretty pricey fast, but man, can you get bursts and just rip bursts onto it, no problem. The CF Express Type B, not a problem. No matter what you do, you put that card in, it'll be able to handle any file you throw at it. My 45 megapixel, at 12 frames a second bursts that I'm doing rapid fire whenever something cool is happening, they never run out of buffer. It's really easy to, f to like empty the buffer as fast as it could onto the card, and that's wonderful. So think about fast memory cards, do a little research and seeing what's the fastest card your camera can handle. Then of course work with your budget and see how many of them you could obtain if you wanna just have all of the data on a card, when your card's full, swap out, put a new card in, and keep going. Uh, I have this awesome file management way that I really, I'll get more in detail on when I'm in the field talking about it, but it's very discouraging to talk about right now or very depressing to talk about now because apparently this thing is discontinued. <laughs> so. I love this product. It's called a Nexto uh, DI NPS 10 or something like that. I'll hold it up on the screen here. Um, it is awesome. It is just a little file reader. It's got micro SD card slots. It's got SD card slots, um, the CF Express card reader, and then two little ports on the bottom that you can plug in portable hard drives or another card reader or something like that. And you can put any kind of SATA hard drive into this thing and just offload all of your card onto this hard drive. 
So in the field, what I like to do is I like to just, since CF Express type B cards are very expensive, the two I have right now are like $200 a pop. That adds up really fast if you want to get more of those, which I will probably sometime down the road, but right now it's just so much money. So what I'll do is I'll fill up that card, pop it into this wonderful portable hard drive thing, say copy the files to that hard drive while shooting with the other card, and then swap them out over the course of the day. We'll get more into that when I'm out in the field and how I operate that thing, but it's really great. If you could find something similar to that, I know there's products like the Narbox that'll do it, but it's pretty expensive because of its ruggedness and it doesn't have a swappable hard drive like this one does. Um, or if you could find one of these, I would recommend picking it up even though they're discontinued. They won't have any product support anymore, but I, it just works right out of the box. So I, I don't really have to have any product support. So there's that. Or you could even, in desperation, if you really want to, you can bring like a small laptop and unload your stuff onto a hard drive that way. But yeah, file management is definitely one of the hardest things that you're gonna have to deal with while you're out there. It can get really expensive by buying multiple cards after multiple cards. Um, but basically when you're taking a lot of shots and you have a high megapixel camera, you're just offloading tons of data onto that card, filling that card up like crazy, and then you gotta figure out what to do with it if you wanna keep shooting more performances. You could also budget the way you shoot, but I also don't like doing that. It's a lot more fun to just, you know, be able to play the game of predict the trick and take the photo. So yeah, that is what you really want to look at is a fast memory card that can unload that buffer really quick and allow you to continue to shoot as fast as possible. Higher storage better, but obviously you have to work within your budget, right? So when choosing a lens for an air show, I'd like to think of wildlife photography. Wildlife photography, usually you're trying to capture like a bird in flight or an animal running across a field. And so you want the action, but you're probably not gonna get very close to the animal when you're trying to get to it. So you need that extra reach to be able to fill the animal as large as possible in the frame. This is true with aircraft photography you're kind of stuck wherever you're positioned at the air show, um, whether that's just at, because you're sitting at your chair and you don't wanna leave your gear, or there's just not very much space to roam around in wherever you're positioned at. So you can't get as close as you'd want with some of the aircraft. With that being said, you want the aircraft to be as large as possible in the frame. You want like that cool shot with the pilot giving a thumbs up as he's going by and things like that. So in order to do that, you need that extra reach to get there. So with camera lenses, I always recommend somewhere between 200 and 400 as a nice range. 200 is very much on the low end. I feel like you're going to lose quite a lot of shots. I would say half of the air show, you're gonna be a little disappointed with how small the aircraft looks in your photo, but you could get away with using it. Uh, 400 is probably the best focal length of all, and to be able to move in like a nice zoom range with that is even better. So for example, an RF 100 to 400 exists, and that is a really nice lens to, on the lower price point range to be able to take out and use for this kind of stuff. I used to use a, a EF 100 to 400 and it got me through a lot of air shows very happily. I now have the RF 100 to 500. That extra 100 millimeters is actually pretty helpful in only some circumstances. Uh, certain air shows, I'm a little bit too far away on the flight line or they're out in the ocean doing something really far away and I just need that little extra reach. That's what's nice about the 500 millimeters. But some air shows, I'm in the photo pit. So I'm up in the flight line itself and I'm underneath the aircraft practically and I'm gonna need to zoom out as much as I can. That's when the 200 to 400 range really comes in handy. I always recommend, I know some people will swear up and down to use prime lenses. Like you can get the real expensive 600 F4, right? 
that guy is fourteen thousand dollars or something like that so it's so much money it's definitely out of my price point range but it's fixed 600 millimeters and i have kind of mixed feelings about that because aircraft are moving around you very fast all over the place depending on your vantage point of where you're able to photograph they might be closer at times it might be farther away at times so i would recommend getting a nice handheld zoom that you can go in a like 200 millimeters in and take a photo there but then all of a sudden it's like corkscrewing out the other direction you're going to want to be able to zoom in even more so i would say get a nice handheld zoom it works the best for this kind of photography it's definitely going to help you the more reach you can get in your camera lens the better if your camera has image stabilization that'll be really helpful when you're trying to photograph prop planes because you're going to use slower shutter speeds which we'll talk about that in the next video but for most part when especially if you're trying to photograph like jet fighters and things like that you're not going to need a stabilizer it's just convenient to have so i wouldn't even worry about having image stabilization uh, most long lenses do anyway but you definitely want to get a really far reaching super telephoto i would say anywhere from 200 to 400 is the sweet spot and 500 is even better if you went with a 600 that could probably work if you went with an 800 who knows that might work too but i know 800s these days are just in prime form so i wouldn't want to recommend that either even though that is a pretty affordable lens to get a 100 to 400 is a great lens to get a 100 to 500 is a great lens to get and i would stick somewhere around there all right so that's the essential pieces of gear that you need more specifically the features that you would have with your camera gear when you're taking it to an air show but really i want to add these little pieces of gear too that should definitely come with you and that is how to manage the sun it is going to be a hot day having that sunshine just right on your face the whole day there's no relief obviously there's no trees anywhere because if there's trees then aircraft could potentially crash into them so there's no trees there's no nothing you're in a big open flight line you're big you're in a big open field you're in a big open beach you're going to just have to deal with the sun so i would argue that this is probably the most essential stuff to bring to an air show whether you're a photographer or not so first up is a hat uh, the hat that i'm using is just a hat called a real deal hat it's some upcycled um, made out of old canvas from brazil or something like that hat that they just sewed together and it's a durable hat i use it like crazy and beat it up as you could see over the years it's been just beat up left and right it's a wonderful hat i use it all the time sunglasses are very important um, having a water bottle is extremely important i'll go ahead and touch on that right now it's important to bring a water bottle and also go ahead and look at your website of the air show itself and see whether or not you could even bring a cooler I know some air shows won't allow any coolers they won't allow any lunch boxes or anything like that and no outside drinks other than a water bottle so it's important to have the water bottle with you and full so that at least you have something to hydrate yourself with also bring cash so that you can purchase at the vending places the vending booths are pretty expensive but that's one of the bigger reasons why they don't allow coolers in because then you won't buy anything from them so it's good to have the water so you could stay alive and stay hydrated and bring some cash if you want to drink in some other way so on top of all of this i bring sunscreen with me as well sunscreen is very helpful because like i said the sun is cooking on you the entire time it's very important to spray at least your arms and legs so yeah i would say those are the obvious things to bring for sun management i would also argue i would bring in a golf umbrella and a folding chair 
Now the golf umbrella can get attached to your folding chair with just something like a rubber twist tie that are like reusable things you could pick up at the hardware store. Or if you could find a better method, please let me know in the comments below so I know that how to make it a little easier for myself because sometimes this twist tie doesn't work. But the golf umbrella is great because it allows you to sit in the chair and while you're waiting for the show to start and get a nice little bit of sun relief. But the golf umbrella is also really nice for you to be able to stage your camera gear on the chair because I know when you're taking pictures, you're gonna be standing up. You're gonna be taking photos as you're standing. You're gonna to need to quickly swap batteries or quickly swap cards or something like that. The chair is a great little like working station and that golf umbrella will keep all that stuff from getting baked in the sun while you're doing that. So golf umbrella, hat, folding chair, sunglasses, sunscreen, and a water bottle. I would argue are probably the most essential pieces of gear you need besides your camera, lens, battery, and memory card. Next up, what I'm gonna bring with me, well, at least not to this one, but if I'm going to an air show that has a flight line and there's aircraft that are what's called static aircraft, they're just parked on the flight line, you get to walk up and down it, and take pictures with them or whatever, that's when I bring out my optional gear. So this Saturday, I'm not gonna have that. I'm gonna have a beach air show. So the beach, there's no static aircraft in the sand. <laughs> so it's just the entire air show out in the water. So I don't need to bring this extra gear with me, but this is a good optional to consider. For one, a second camera. It's always nice to have a second body if you're in a situation where you want a different lens, but you don't want to switch the lenses out because out in the field, it can get dirty, sandy, salty, whatever, as you're switching lenses. So it's nice to have like two cameras and that'll give you that option. But I don't know, the other camera is not really important when it comes to the features I was talking about earlier. You don't need fast frames a second if you don't want to. You don't need a super high megapixel if you don't want to. Um, in fact, what I usually do for a second camera body is I bring my Canon EOS R and that has 30 megapixels, but it only shoots like, I think like four frames a second and shoots really slow. And that's perfect for my situation, which is I'm just trying to photograph static aircraft or you know, whatever's happening in the air show itself before all the aerial performances happen. So a second camera body is useful. If you don't have it, it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. It's just another option you can use. You can also just use your phone if you really wanna take some extra little pop shots like that. With that being said, if you did bring a second camera body or if you are risky and like to change out your lenses, before an air show starts and you wanna walk around and take pictures of static aircraft, I would bring a wide angle lens. Now the lens I'm showing right now is a 14 millimeter Rokinon that I got that is RF and I guess RF is now discontinued, but Rokinon's a nice and cheap lens to bring along with me. I also sometimes bring the RF 24 to 70 because it's a little more flexible and I could do more things with it but the wide angle of 14 or 24 is great for static aircraft. Just keep in mind when you're taking pictures of these aircraft on the tarmac or on the flight line, whatever you wanna call it, try to get there as early as possible in the day. I know you're gonna to go to the air show as early as possible anyway, because you wanna get a good spot for photographing without anybody in your way, but it's really good to have the static aircraft photographed first before a bunch of um, you know audience members and guests and stuff come in and then they walk around the aircraft and they get in the way of your shot. So if you want a full body of the aircraft parked on the cement, you're gonna wanna get there early with a nice wide angle lens and get some good shots of that to start out your day. All right, so we're now we're at the fun stuff, which is the behind the scenes things. Now this is something I just started recently kind of developing over the last like, maybe year or so. It winds up being um, just kind of smaller cameras that I always like to play with for fun. 
that give me kind of a nice little enhancement to be able to share my experiences out and about. For example, when I go to film this Saturday, a lot of the footage that you're gonna see while I'm in the field is gonna be taken with something like a GoPro or an Insta360 Go 2. And we'll talk about that now. So what this is, is it's behind the scenes is the easiest way that I put the nomenclature down for this kind of camera system. And it, all it is is it's a smaller censored camera that you can stick somewhere and film yourself or film what's going on around you while you're taking these photos at this air show. So there's lots of different mounting options. You can mount the camera on your lens. You can mount the camera on your camera. You can mount the camera on a little tripod by your feet and then be able to take pictures that way uh, or videos that way. You can attach microphones and things like that and get like audio and like cool audio and stuff of what you're doing. Um, it just kind of gives a well to the overall experience if you want to share what took you all of this effort to get these photos. Um, you could then share that with social media and then people will get a little more understanding of the work that you put in in order to get these really cool aircraft shots. So the first one of that is the GoPro. I already kind of mentioned that and we're gonna be using that GoPro this Saturday uh, quite a lot for some of the basic video stuff that we do. A small sensor camera that's very portable and can come with you. So you could just leave it in your bag and then when you wanna take a picture or a video or something really quick, you can pull it out and use it. Um, it also fits on top of your camera quite nicely. So you get this kind of like point of view from your camera's perspective kind of thing. There's also multiple mounts and options to make the GoPro fit for your needs and what you do. Uh, I have a GoPro Hero 9 because over the years, there's been so many glitches and issues that GoPro has. I don't even bother upgrading it anymore until it breaks. So I have a GoPro 9 and what I like to do is I like to put a Rode VideoMic Go shotgun mic on top of it and then just kind of get the awesome audio of like a jet engine roaring through the sky and just getting that really cool sound. That's kind of all I really use it for, which is why I'm gonna have a great time using it on that video that I'm gonna put out next because it's gonna be used for a lot more scenarios than just a little bit of background noise kind of stuff. Um, the ones I use the most, honestly, is the Insta360 Go 2 and my phone. Those are the two things I use the most. The Insta360 Go 2 is not a 360 camera. It's actually a camera that is just the size of my thumb and it's magnetic and waterproof and it films everything in a circle. So then later, what's cool about it is later in post, I can make it either a vertical video or a horizontal video out of that one same clip. So then I could share it on things like Instagram Reels or as an Instagram post itself or as a Facebook post, depending on what aspect ratio I wanna turn it to. So that's really great and useful. So it's kind of one of those set it, forget it, and film kind of things. But also because it's the size of my thumb, it's also really lightweight, which allows me to put it onto the lens hood of my 100 to 500. So it can point towards me on that lens hood and then show like a cool perspective of me panning across the sky as I take a photo or I could put it on top of my camera and show the lens as a POV, kind of like I could do with my phone or my GoPro. It's also got like a little magnet pendant, which actually I'm using right now, as you see here, to hold my microphone to my shirt. And it's just a little necklace. I can't even show it that well, but that's okay. But uh, yeah, it's a little necklace that just can hold that thumb camera no problem for another cool perspective. All the mounts have a little magnet on them, so you could just take the camera out and slap it onto that mount really quickly. And that's why I really like that for behind the scenes for the most part. It only films like 2.7K and 
of course, when you crop it, it's going to get even smaller, but, you know, it is perfectly fine for something like social media posts. And, of course, you can mount to your camera with your phone. All you need is a little phone holder mount that can attach to a hot shoe, and then you can put it on your camera's hot shoe and put the phone in there that way and have cool little POV perspectives, little behind the scene perspectives with the video settings on your phone. It works wonderfully like that. And I use my phone a lot for quick little behind the scenes photos, both for social media posts and also as part of my workflow to get like GPS location tags and some other things like that. So behind the scenes stuff is really helpful. It's all primarily smaller sensor stuff that just is, is what I like to use for video, I like to use for documentation, little notes and stuff like that. And it's just fun to add to the overall experience. And I want to emphasize that. Fun to add. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it distract you. And don't overall take away from your experience of getting those photos at the air show. You're there to take photos at the air show. If you're taking videos all the time and you miss key points because you're trying to fiddle with your behind the scenes camera, you're gonna be kind of disgruntled by that, or at least I have been in the past. So it's good to make sure that you play with it within reason, but if it's seemingly getting in the way, just leave it, it's not that big of a deal. Just focus on the photos, because that's the whole point of going out to the air show is to photograph cool jets in the sky, not really to take videos with a tiny sensor camera. All right, and the best part of all of this, everything I just talked about can fit into a few bags on your back. So this is a little like fun clip that I just kind of put together to show you what I would look like wearing what I'm gonna wear on Saturday. I've got my hat and my sunglasses on, obviously water bottle hanging off the side. And then I have three bags that are attached. Okay, well, that was everything that I could talk about as far as what I'm going to bring on Saturday. Uh, in summary, real quick, it's a Canon R5, a CF Express Type B um, card, a set of OEM batteries, uh, usually four of them, the Canon RF 100 to 500 lens, a GoPro Hero 9 with a Rode video microphone on top of it, a Insta360 Go 2, and a phone mount. And, whew, so that was pretty long-winded, but I hope that it was pretty informative for you on what gear that I like to bring um, that has essential features for an air show as far as getting the shot that you're looking for. Uh, the next video, we're actually going to go to an air show on the beach, and it's a good walk from the parking lot, and then you have to sit in line for a long time. So we'll go into all that detail, as well as how I set up everything, what kind of settings I use, the timing of the shots, and also file management. And then when we get home from all of that, um, hopefully, if we get some good shots, I really hope so, um, we'll be able to edit those photos and kind of, I'll kind of guide you through how to process them. So after all of this experience, I hope that you're inspired to get out there and take some really great air show photos. If you don't get really great air show photos on your first few times going to an air show, don't worry about it. It's just for fun. This is one of those more entertaining aspects of things. It's kind of just the fun game to get the good shot kind of practice runs that you can do. And there's plenty of air shows that you can attend that are all exhilarating and tons of fun to check out. With that being said, you get all the nice experience in taking these photos and you get better at a lot of things, your reaction times and timing of everything. And then you will get that shot that you're really looking for. So anyway, if you liked this video and you want to see the other video, please consider liking and subscribing. That'll give you a little bit of a heads up before anybody else of when the photo is actually coming out. And if you want to see the photos that I take at this coming up air show or any future 
or past air shows, go ahead and follow this Instagram right here. This is my aircraft air show specific Instagram. And then if you would just want to see everything that I like to do, I play all different kinds of genres, then go ahead and check out this website right here. So without further ado, I hope you have a great time and I will see you out in the field. Have a good one.